morning, everyone. Um, thanks for attending our uh, healthcare half hour. This is our second one, and you should keep watch because we're going to be doing conversations like these monthly. Goal is to have a quick morning conversation, give you some information, pro you know, provide some provocative thoughts for you to think about, and then let you get on with your day. So I hope you have your coffee with you um, this morning. I am so pleased to be talking this morning with Eric Garcia. Um, Eric has just published a, a book called We're Not Broken. Eric is um, a journalist based in Washington, DC. Previously, he was an assistant editor at the Washington Post's Outlook section and an associate editor at The Hill, as well as a correspondent for the National Journal, Market Watch, and Roll Call. He's also written for The Daily Beast, New Republic, and Salon.com. Right now, he's the senior Washington correspondent for The um, Independent. That's from the, uh, from the UK. Um, one of the most important things here is that Eric is Tar Heel dead. He is a proud graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the journalism program there. He graduated in 2013, 14. Eric? 14, 14. Oh, 2014. And so um, I've been following Eric's career for ooh, close to a decade now. Um, it's hard to believe that that much time has passed and mm -hmm. um, have, have been just so pleased to see him just rocket uh, to the, you know, to the top of the Washington uh, press pool. So it's very exciting. He has uh, just published a book. Um, it's uh, We're Not Broken. And, um, and I'm blanking on the um, Chasing the Autism Conversation. Chasing the Autism Conversation. And um, so we're going to talk to him this morning about uh, the uh, about that autism conversation. So um, you know, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna jump right in. Eric is someone who gladly, uh, you know, publicly uh, acknowledges the fact that he is an autistic person, and so um, I'm gonna jump right in, Eric, and ask you a question that you know I was reading your book, and unfortunately, I only got it about two days ago, so I've been cramming through it, um, and there's lots yeah. of thoughts, lots of thoughts in there, but. Um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me, I think for a long time as journalists, we've been, you know, we've been sort of had it pounded into our heads, like we should be talking about people first. So the language has been people with autism, people with disabilities, but I hear you say autistic people, you know, what, and I, I was struck by that terminology. Can you sort of um, explain a little bit of that to me? Certainly. So one of the things that I think for a long time, person first language was used for uh, autism. And that was really for a long time, that was I think what parents preferred and what clinicians preferred. Um, and I, it, I think it goes back to the fact that um, just in my estimation, um, autism for a long time was seen as a symptom of schizophrenia. If you read a lot of older magazine articles like I went through a lot of articles in Newsweek and in Time and Life Magazine, things like that. It's called childhood schizophrenia and as, as late as the 1970s. Um, uh, and it wasn't until 1980 that it was included in the Diagnostic Statistical um, Manual of Mental Disorders as a separate diagnosis from schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, that's always a mouthful. Otherwise um, known as the DSM. We'll the, leave it the for DSM, that now. Yes, the DSM. Um, so that happened, but I think that over time would a lot, in a lot of, I think for a reason why is because a lot of parents didn't want their kids defined by their autism. But I think what has happened is that a lot of autistic people, especially as self-advocacy has changed and has emerged, uh, a lot of autistic people say that um, this is something that's inextricable from them. To change their autism or to remove their autism from them would be to remove an, a, distinguish, a distinct trait from them. So that's why you've seen a move to identity first language that is not unlike um, little people using, calling themselves little people or deaf people using identity first language or blind people using identity first language. At the same time, um, there are many autistic people. I mean, th there are many people, autistic people with intellectual disabilities. And you see what I just did there. 
people with intellectual disabilities tend to prefer person first language. So that's how you can say autistic person with intellectual disabilities. So the language has changed over time as self advocates have become more vocal. And this is also, and this is something that comes reading your book, um, you know, you're, and you're talking about self advocacy. There is that, and I guess there's also a linguistic debate about high functioning versus yes. low functioning. You know, and I think a lot of the folks you talk about are, you know, somewhat high functioning, although you could say that Hari Srinivasan, like, you know, some people would see him as low functioning, even though he's a student at Columbia University. Uh, to right? Berkeley. Berkeley, 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah, so um, that was a really important thing. When, when, I real, when I started writing about autism, I used to think about things in high functioning and low functioning terms. But one of the things I've come to realize is that um, those terms really don't serve autistic people well. I feel as a journalist, our job is to portray the world as is. And the reason why I don't think high functioning and low functioning work is because they're terms that are created by non-autistic people for how they perceive autism, rather than what uh, how autistic people see themselves or what or how they articulate their needs. So, for example, let's talk about Hari. Uh, I talk about you talk about Hari Srinivasan. Let's talk about him. Hari Srinivasan is uh, someone many people would consider low functioning. He has he cannot speak. He has limited vocal capacity. He has voter vocal apraxia so oftentimes he'll make involuntary sounds with his mouth um and for a long time as a result he was subjected to aba people tried to force him to talk a lot of people consider him low functioning it wasn't until uh, a teacher of his gave him uh taught him how to use a communication device a typing device that he really started to thrive and people started to accept him and he went to community college, I believe it was San Jose City College. Then now he's a student at Berkeley. Uh, and now he is on the federal government. He's now sits on the board of the federal government's interagency autism coordinating committee, which is uh, the federal government's advisory board on autism. So that's an example of how someone could be considered low, how the world saw Hari as a low functioning person. But he, you know, if given the right supports and the right knee and the and the right accommodations, he can actually be very high functioning. Conversely, uh, I profile a, a woman by the name of Julia Bascom, who's the executive director for the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, and she's somebody pe many people would consider high functioning. She has advised presidential candidates on their disability policies. She's obviously the head of a very of a, of a very prominent nonprofit, um, but she has a live-in support person. And she has said very publicly, and she taught, told me that she would not be able to do all the things she does without that kind of live and support person. So what I've come to realize is that the words high functioning and low functioning really kind of failed people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that what I prefer to say is high support needs or low support needs or autistic people with intellectual disabilities or non-speaking autistic people because those describe what what autistic people are rather than or what they need rather than what they um, rather than ra ra rather than how people perceive them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um I think part of this too is like uh, you and I when we when we talked earlier this week talked a little bit about sort of um, kind of the state of the stigma and I, and I think there's it feels like there's a dialogue between self advocacy and the state of the stigma and then and then kind of like and then policy on top of that and I know that you and I both are very much concerned about policy you know yeah. how does this how does this kind of changing of kind of self uh, reflection starting to be reflected in policy. Yeah, so this is this is going to be a long answer. So essentially, we have to go back to 1990, and the uh, and what happened is in the 1980s, uh, as I mentioned before, the DSM didn't include autism as a separate diagnosis until 1980. Around 1987, it included pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified 
uh, there was another condition that, that, that I'm blanking on, that in 1994, they had uh, Asperger's syndrome. Um, then uh, what happened is in 2013, that all goes under the larger umbrella of autism, autism spectrum disorder. Conversely, what also happened was uh, in 1990, and this is the 30, this week is the 34th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then I believe in October is going to be the 31st anniversary of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is actually a reauthorization of the uh, Education for Handicapped Children Act. And, um, and what happened is the federal government has never really lived up to its promises in both the ADA or the IDEA. Uh, the federal government is supposed to pay about 40% of the cost for IDEA, and a lot of businesses still have gotten deferrals on uh, ADA. But what was important was IDEA specifically included uh, autism after previously considering it a mental illness. It was now included under, as a disability. So what happened? That meant that schools that received taxpayer dollars had to report how many autistic students they were serving. So it led to more autistic people getting services, more autistic people getting diagnosed. And now that generation, that first generation has grown up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happens is now you're seeing a lot of them because they received those services and because they were, however meager they were, or they received those accommodations, however half-hearted they were, they now had a working language and they got services that they otherwise wouldn't have had and they learned to advocate for themselves. Go ahead. So, and, and your generation, I am, I am so impressed with what good self-advocates your generation is. So like, you know, it's the internet generation that's digital. Yeah. And so you have both, not only the services, but the tools. Yeah, so, so that's the other thing. I, I, think, I think that social media is an incredible presence. So basically now those people have grown up and now they can advocate for themselves. So a friend of mine asked me, why have self-advocates won the day? I actually argue they haven't won the day yet. What I would say is they have, now autistic voices can no longer be ignored. Mm -hmm. So there was that movie that Sia put out earlier this year called Music that uh, was panned by a lot of autistic people. Actually, and, and then because it had a scene about, uh, of her, of one character restraining and pressing down an autistic person. And it led to so much backlash, Sia deleted her Twitter account because she was fighting with autistic people the whole time. She went complete, she went full Donald Trump on these people. Um, uh, you know, so, it led to, so now it's no longer that autistic people are winning. It's that now you can no longer put something out about autism and not expect pushback. Another perfect example of this is the Netflix series Atypical, um, which a lot of autistic people, myself, hate with a passion. Um, and because the main character is not played by an autistic person, it's a very flat, one-dimensional, one-dimensional portrayal of autism. That can't you can't get away with just doing that anymore. Um, converse in the same way, it's also influenced policy. So, for example, I write about this in the book. Is I, I was I was just about to I was just about to ask you some about policy and yeah. So so let's talk about that. Yeah. So I, I mentioned Hillary Clinton in the book, but 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 let's talk about that. Yeah, because no, you were saying, um, you know, how is policy changing? And then, of course, right now we've got this huge fight going on about the infrastructure bill, which includes things for home and community based care. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like what? So, what's yeah, the let's state talk of that? About that. Mm -hmm. So, I think that what happened is now, so the 2020 presidential election was really important. And I actually need to go back to 2016 and talk about, if we do that, we, could, we should talk about um, 2016 because that was really instrumental because that was the year that Hillary Clinton put out the first autism presidential policy platform on autism. And Hillary Clinton, <clears throat> I've criticized the Clintons a lot in the past. So you didn't, so, but one of the things about Hillary Clinton is that since she was a student at Yale Law School, she was following the autism debate. Oh. Back when parents thought that autism was caused by unloving parents. 
Mm -hmm. um, but then she started when she was first lady of Arkansas, she met a lot of people with autistic kids. And she mm -hmm. kind of started to question the science around that. And then of course that was debunked. And we can talk about that more a little later. Um, and initially in her 2007, 2008 campaign, a lot of her advisors were parent advocates. But in 2016, a lot of her a lot of her advisors on that policy platform were autistic self advocates because they grew up. Um, and then now in 2020, you saw autistic self advocates had a really wonderful dilemma, which is they got to choose from many presidential candidates who had disability plans, whether it was mainstream Democrats like Pete Buttigieg and Cory Booker, uh, or uh, progressive Democrats like Julian Castro and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. The one person who did it was Joe Biden. Um, mm. And uh, actually Kamala Harris had the first disability policy plan um, when she was running mm. for president. So Biden actually didn't have a disability policy plan and it pissed off, if I can say that, a lot of disability and a lot of autistic self-advocates that he didn't until two months after Bernie Sanders dropped out. But since then, to his credit, he's hired, a, he's um, he's appointed a lot of people in disability and he put out a really bold plan, which was in his infrastructure plan, he planned to, he announced for uh, a desire to spend $400 billion on Medicaid home and community based services. And that is uh, to borrow from the president, a BFD. Um, because there is, I think the wait list for home and community based care, which allows people to get services in their home as opposed to institutions or nursing homes. The wait list is around 700,000 on that. Uh, Rose? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Um, I think so, you're frozen, but keep going. We can hear you. We just can't yeah, okay. see you. Oh, shoot. Um, hold on. Uh, uh, no, wait, you're back. You're back. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that, yeah. So that is a BFD because, um, because the wait list is around 700 or 800,000. I forget, depending on the latest numbers I was reading. Uh, it can take up to 10 years mm -hmm. to get. Kids are told to get on there. I've, been, I've heard people say, put their kids on when they're five so that they can get on it when they're, you know, adults. Um, oh, or, or, in North Carolina, we have a 10 year waiting list. We've yeah, there's 15,000 people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like, I should say like around eight and then they, then they get on it like when they're 18 mm -hmm. or they're 21. Uh, so so, so the, the wait list is extraordinarily long. So this would uh, eliminate the wait list. Um, that's being debated in the reconciliation bill right now. Uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema has said she opposes the reconciliation bill as of right now for 3.5 trillion, but that is uh, something that's being debated right now. Uh, but yeah, that is, you, you know, it's really important. It's really shows and it is a testament that autistic self advocates can now speak for themselves and say, this is what we want. This is what we demand on uh, the same way they've advocated for ending some minimum wage labor. They've advocated for better treatment in hospitals. Um, so this is so this is very what, I, what I'm trying to say. And if I could, if if there is any one kind of underlying thesis of this book, is that nobody's lives are determined by their own decisions. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, what gives people the ability to make those decisions are things beyond their control, the like law, policy, culture. Um, and and Eric, like you're you're getting at the, the entire reason why I got into journalism, because yeah. when I was nursing, I kept seeing that my patients were being pushed around by policy questions that they had no control over. Yes. And, you know, sort of like, how do you how do you sort of help people understand policy better? Um, and and, and there, there's a question in the chat about ABA. Yes. And I, and I guess that's part of like. So I'm guessing that. It, it, what it feels like to me is what you're saying is that we've got ABA and more people are getting it. And then now you have autism self-advocates kind of going like, hey, wait a minute, it's not the greatest thing for me. Like talk a little bit about ABA. Sure, so ABA, as we know, is, was largely started by a guy by the name of Ola Ivar Lovas, who was a uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, I forget, uh, uh, at, at UCLA. Um, uh, and essentially what he was do uh, was he was, he was using behavioral psychology uh, to try to use conditioning for autistic people. And in the past he, he was, you know, he used shocks, he used screams, he used slaps, but over time those tapered off. And now it's a lot about conditioning. And so a lot of parents actually praise ABA and some autistic people themselves praise ABA. 
Uh, I don't want to erase those people. But a lot of autistic self-advocates, including Harish Srinivasan, who I interview in the book. So like a perfect example of this is Amy Gravino, who's autistic in the book. She's, uh, she's a practitioner of ABA, and she's autistic. Um, and then Harish Srinivasan said, you know, it was hell for him or it was impossible for him because it was trying to make him act more neurotypical. And I think that's the big debate is a lot of autistic people say that ABA is torture or they're taught not to stim or to flap their hands or they're forced to make eye contact or they're, the, the point they feel is to make them act more neurotypical instead of accepting them and mitigating the things that make autism an impairment. Because I think a lot of people think that people who support neurodiversity think that autism is a disability. It is a disability. Autistic self-advocates have actually fought to include in the Americans with Disabilities Act and include in the larger disability rights movement. So it is a disability. Um, so a lot of autistic people and self-advocates have said that there should be more focus on fixing the impairments or working on comorbid conditions or things like epilepsy. And a lot of, uh, but a lot of parents, of parents think that it's a good thing. And also because it's been the only game in town, a lot of times parents, because uh, I mean, it's become the one thing that insurers will cover. So a lot of times it's the only thing that parents will say. And this is what I, I promised I would promise Rose I would save this for the for, for this chat. A lot of parent, a lot of autistic people consider it torture. And I think that's why it's a very, very fraud issue. Because a lot of parents, when they hear that, well, I went through ABA and it was torture, a lot of parents say, wait, you're saying I torture my kid? And that leads to parents becoming very, very defensive. But I don't think that it's necessarily an indictment of the parents unless they continue doing it. You know, unless unless your parents, unless you continue to do something when autistic people continue to tell you it's torture, then it's a bad thing. So for example, the a federal appeals court uh, ruled last uh, two weeks ago that using shock therapy on autistic people uh, at this school called the Judge Roddenberg Center in Canton, Massachusetts is, uh, allowed. The FDA can't ban it because the FDA tried to ban it for using it for autistic people, uh, using it on autistic people. And a lot of parents still swear by it because they say it helps and self-interest behavior. But a lot of people who survived the Judge Roddenberg Center say, no, this was torture. It led to post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's led to this very, very controversial. So that's not ABA as a whole, but that's kind of indicative of a larger debate and the larger framing is a lot of autistic people say, no, we don't want this. And a lot of uh, parents, but a lot of parents say, this is the thing that we want. So it goes to that really large central debate. And because it's one of the only things that insurers will cover, that's what a lot of parents will default to. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to do a, a little uh, station identification. Um, I, I want to remind folks that Eric's book is um, officially um, available next week on okay. August 3rd. And it's your publisher is... Hot and Mifflin Harcourt, but it was just bought by HarperCollins. So... Okay. And you can find it online at hmhbooks.com. And the, the book is We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation. Um, I also uh, would be remiss if I didn't remind folks that you're, uh, you're witnessing this uh, conversation uh, this morning on North Carolina's health, North Carolina Health News' Healthcare Half Hour. Um, we are a not-for-profit news organization. We are supported by uh, your donations. Um, and so I uh, would ask you if you would like to see more conversations like this, more coverage of important policy topics that um, you support North Carolina Health News, um, either with a one-time donation or a monthly sustaining donation. So, um, and thank you very much to the folks who are on the um, call who are donors. You can also sign up for our newsletter. We send out a newsletter twice a week on Monday mornings and on Thursday mornings. And um, it's, uh, it's short and sweet, and um, it's, it's a way to keep up with our headlines. And I also do a roundup of um, some important other voices in the healthcare conversation every week. So um, I want to get back to, Eric, you know, uh, something that you, you, you talked about, Julian Castro. Um, one of the things that was really interesting in your book is talking about uh, the experience of people of color um, in, yeah. with autism, you know, so you say that people of color are, are less likely to be diagnosed with autism. Yeah. Um, so they're, so black people and autistic people, the gap has closed a little bit or significantly, I should say for 
black people for black children but a lot of times black children are still misdiagnosed with um behavioral personality disorder or behavioral disorders as a or behavioral disorders as a whole a lot Maybe of times, like oppositional defiant disorder oppositional defiance disorder things like that um which leads to them being disciplined more than treat, you know, than, than, than getting the services they need. Uh, also, a lot of times they get diagnosed later. So in an apples to apples comparison from like 2006, it's a seminal study or 2002 was a seminal study of Medicaid patients that were black and white, black, black and white children who were both on Medicaid. So apples to apples, um, black children were still diagnosed later. They got uh, also a lot of times uh, they, uh, a lot of times parents will just, uh, because they don't have insurance or they don't have services, they just won't get the diagnosis because it costs a lot of money to get, di- get diagnosed. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you have insurance or even if you're on Medicaid. Um, <clears throat> um, on top of that, a, there's a big language gap. Uh, it's important to remember a lot of, excuse me, the uh, diagnostic systems and a lot of the diagnostic tools we use to diagnose autism are done in English. So if Definitely. English is your second language, um, <clears throat> particularly if you're a Latino, a lot of service providers don't do services in Spanish, or if you're Asian American, or if you're anything else, um, or if you're from African countries, or even if you're from Europe. So a lot of people, a lot of immigrants don't get diagnosed until later, uh, or, or children of immigrants. Um, and uh, just want to remind folks that we're taking questions. So if you have any questions, you can put them into the chat. We're going to keep talking for about, I don't know, five minutes more, um, and, but if you have a question, jump in now and, um, and we can take them. So, um, so you're talking about this diagnostic gap, Eric. It makes me think that somehow or another, this, this is getting sort of, um, this plays into that school to prison pipeline. Yeah. Um, do, is, are there any data about like the this number is, of people with autism, like maybe in prison or in jail? This is the hard thing because There has yet to be, the CDC put on an estimate of how many autistic people, autistic adults there are in America. Um, But it was project, I think it was, I might be, I'm gonna bastardize the data, but um, it was basically projecting from the amount of children that are. So there hasn't been a full comprehensive survey, like there was in the United Kingdom. Oh, there was. um, That showed there was basically a similar amount of autistic children and autistic adults, but that's because the UK has the NHS. Um, So it's a lot harder in the US to do that because there are people who are still undiagnosed. There's still a lot of people who might not have insurance. There's not that comprehensive. There's not that centralized data data component. So we don't really know Mm -hmm. um, what the exact number of autistic people are in the United States of America. Mm-hmm. Uh, or autistic adults there are in the United States of America. But we uh, do know so- that there are a lot of people with um, mental health disorders yes. who, are in, who are in prison. Mm-hmm. So part of me wonders like if there's some overlap there's, there. There's pro- there probably is. Again, there would need to be, um, there would really need to be a comprehensive survey that, uh, that actually looks into it. Um, but, that, but, but, but there has yet to be that kind of, There has yet to be one, and I'm skeptical if there could be one in the United States just because of the way that our healthcare system is kind of a patchwork system. Um, It's, you know, people are on different insurance plans, then on top of that, there aren't real, there's not really an American healthcare system. There's 51 healthcare systems with Mm -hmm. kind of a a federal government blanket on top. Yeah. You know, uh, so we're getting new. Yeah, and so your, I mean, there's been other books about autism, right? What are the, and uh, Ray, uh, you, you're, you're, you're anticipating my question. You know, what was your goal in writing this book? Like, what was, you know, what, what were you trying to get out there? Yeah, um, good question. What I was trying to get out there was, I felt like most of the discussions about autism mm-hmm. and policy either began or ended with um, either talking about vaccines, which we should say that is 100% a hoax. Mm -hmm. Vaccines do not cause autism. Study after study after study after study has shown that. Um, So go get your COVID vaccine. (laughs) Um, Second of all, 
most of the discussion was about curing or mitigating autism. A lot of the research, something like 75% of uh, research in America for autism is focused on either uh, biology, what causes autism, risk factors, or treatment. Conversely, a small sliver goes toward researching services or lifespan issues. Um, and what I really wanted to do is I really wanted people to realize that those discussions, that the way we discuss autism now doesn't really address the needs of autistic people today. Mm -hmm. So really what I wanted to do is I really wanted to reframe and say that what can we do to help autistic, because I'm not necessarily opposed to biology, to researching biology. I'm not necessarily even opposed to looking at risk factors. I do think though that those are such long-term goals that they're not going to fit. They're not going to help people right here and right now. So Ray's question is the key takeaways that you want your readers I and to, to understand. I wanted to reframe the conversation. Mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. to reframe how we talk about autism. I'm a political journalist by day and I wanted people in politics and people who are self-advocates and parent advocates as well. Because I do think a lot of people are going to think that I'm anti-parent. I'm not anti-parent. There's tons of great parents. You talk and, so lovingly about your parents and the support you've gotten from them. Yes. Like, and I talk a lot about great parents, you know, of, of all, just, you know, Lydia Wayman, uh, Shannon Disroaches Rosa, Ron Fournier. They're all amazing parents. Uh, David Perry is another guy I know. Um, uh, there are so many fantastic parents. Um, but what I wanted is for parents, self-advocates, everybody to real, to better be able to advocate for themselves and the people they love and to advocate for things that can help them in the here and now. So you're saying, and this was Ray, this was, um, uh, Ray Hema Challenger's question, which is like the action to be taken is advocacy around services. Yeah, absolutely. Or yeah, like home activity based care um, or changing the way we pay. Because a lot of autistic people, a lot of disabled people as a whole are still paid below minimum wage. It's legal to do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of autistic people are still still face a lot of obstacles in the healthcare system because people don't take them seriously. I, I talk about it in the book, and I'm sure you read the thing I wrote about Lydia Wayman. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, uh, so so what I wanted was for people to take those needs seriously. Mm -hmm. For people, and the, 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 then there was a second goal. The second goal was I wanted people to recognize that even as good as parents can be, and as good as clinicians, all that. Autistic people need to be at the center of any debate about autism. Mm -hmm. That um, that whole nothing about us without us yeah. conversation. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got two more questions here um, in the chat. Um, one person is asking, so what is an alternative to ABA? Is, is there? There are some. There's things like floor time. Uh, I was never so I should say I was never subjected to ABA, and I think I turned out pretty well. Um, there's occupational therapy. Um, that's really extraordinarily helpful. There are uh, treatments for, there are ways to teach autistic people who don't speak how to type mm -hmm. or how to communicate so, elsewhere. These would fall under home and community-based services. Yeah, a lot, of these would, a lot of these would, or the, a lot of these would be educational services, so. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's one last question, then we probably need to go, because we, we can go, you've got another five minutes, Eric? Uh, yeah, 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 go for Thank it. you, because I, I know you're busy. I mean, you're a yeah. Washington correspondent and it's been a busy week on DC. Yeah. Um, so the last question here is a transition to adulthood can be difficult for everyone. Can you speak to the challenges you faced in college and beyond that may be different as an autistic person and how you overcame them? Sure. That's a small so, question. This is a small ball question. Um, it's really difficult because one of the things that I could say, so I don't see myself as overcoming autism. I see myself as overcoming ableism. Um, That's a great just the same way any disabled person does. The thing that got me through at the end, because I, before I went to UNC, I went to community college where there were a lot of great disability services. Another thing at the University of North Carolina was when I tanked a test and I, because I didn't want to ask for services for a long time at, at UNC because I felt that, uh, well, if I'm at university, I must not be really disabled and I don't want to take resources from other people, um, which is really some internalized ableism but then when I tanked a test and I went to a professor and said, look, I need help. Um, immediately what he did, I'll never forget his name was Dr. David Peary, he's a professor of African music because I needed an elective. He called the uh, 
disability services or whatever they call it at UNC. And he said, if they're waiting for you, go. Uh, so it required good professors. And it required a good support system. It required people who were understanding mm -hmm. and what needs to happen. So I'm thankful for Dr. David Pierre. I'm also thankful for another professor of mine, Farrell Guillory, who I read about. Um, kind of the, uh, for those who don't know, he's kind of the dean of North Carolina political journalism. Um, but one of the things is that it shouldn't just be what if both of them had said no. Mm -hmm. What matters more is making schools and making systems accommodating as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. interesting because the um, as as you, as we talked about before we started, I'm here. I'm at the, actually at the beach with some friends, and um, the couple that we're with, the woman is uh, on the faculty at UNC. Yeah. And um, so I said to her, like the, in your book, you talk about going into or Farrell calling you into his office and closing the door and saying to you. Um, I, like, are you on the spectrum you or yes, yeah. burgers, right? And she was like, Ooh, that's really hard, right? Because that's a fraught conversation. That is like, a fraught conversation. And, and I talk about it because like on one end, I wanted to ask him, what gives you the right to ask that? Right. Um, on the other end, it saved me. Right. So right. I don't know what the right answer is on that. Right. Yeah. No, she was really like, yeah. So she was like, when, when you get the book, like, I want to get the book because, because she is at UNC. We talked about the office of disability services and, you know, and she was like, oh, that's, that's really, because she's talked about having folks um, um, with autism in her class. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, 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 the big problem is it like, and I know that we, you know, we only have a little bit of time. The problem is about asking for disability services is it still puts the onus on the student. And I write mm -hmm. about that in the book. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm instead of putting the onus on the classroom and the teacher, the professor or whatever. But that's so, but then you have like teachers sort of making this judgment call and what if they're yeah, wrong? Yeah, yeah, like, you know. but the other thing is that maybe there should be a universal design so that they're just accommodating as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's just, cause it's, it's really, point. cause it's, you don't want to stand out if you're a student, you don't want to see like, be seen like you're a special treatment, especially when you're in college when, uh, when uh, you, 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 you know, like that, like that's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, it's, it's, it's 10 after nine. I want to say, um, you know, when I spoke to Eric this week and we did our pre-interview, you know, one of the things he told me is that he wanted to write a book that you could read on an airplane that wasn't a slog. And I will say I've been cramming this book and it is so easy to read. It's super enjoyable. It moves quickly. Your, your writing teachers were terrific, I must say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm going to encourage folks to go out and get it. It's um, We're Not Broken, uh, Changing the Conversation, the Autism Conversation. It's um, uh, HarperCollins, and um, it comes out next week. You can pre-order it now. If you just put We're Not Broken Garcia into your Google search, it'll pop right up. And um, I want to thank Eric so much for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk to us this morning. I really appreciate it. This has been great. This has been fun. Uh, I have a deep love of North Carolina, of the state of North Carolina. I'm grateful for it. Uh, the state of North Carolina paid for my education because uh, I got free tuition. So I am forever grateful and indebted to the people of North Carolina. Yay, Tor Heels. Yeah. So, um, so thank you so much, folks. And just want to remind you, you're on Healthcare Half Hour from uh, North Carolina Health News. We do this once a month. Next month, we're talking about um, uh, adult care homes and um, aging services. Um, last month, we talked about um, uh, mental health and the overuse of um, involuntary commitment in mental health. You folks can go to our uh, the links that we provided in the chat, and you can watch last week last month's um, conversation. This month's conversation will be up on the web um, in a in an hour or so, and then um, stay tuned. And uh, also, just want to thank our many donors who are on the call and uh, make a, a plea for donations. You know, we are a not for profit news organization. We are. I think at this point in time, uh, it's not really bragging to say that we are the primary source for healthcare news in North Carolina. And um, I, we can only do that with your support. So thank no, you so don't, much. Don't be finicky about the humility. You are the definitive uh, 
Healthcare News Source, North Carolina. So. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. So um, thanks so much, folks. And uh, we're going we're gonna to stop recording now and say we'll see you next month on our Healthcare Health Hour.